As a mother, wife, and divorce attorney for over 15 years, experience has taught me a lot about how to deal with times of uncertainty, transition, and facing opportunities for growth. I'm happy you're joining me for this part of the journey. The number of people in the United States living with sex addiction is estimated to be anywhere from 12 to 30 million people. Sex is of course such an important part of our human relationships and it's no wonder that so many families are struggling with sex addiction these days. Why is sex addiction so pervasive? What is it? And what opportunities for treatment are available if you or someone you know is struggling with sex addiction? These are just some of the questions I'm gonna be talking to with my guest today. Sam John is a licensed professional counselor. He's also a certified sex addiction therapist, and he has a practice at Breaking Free Solutions located here in North Texas, but offering services to couples around the country. Sam, I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. I wanna start off our conversation today by asking, what is sex addiction? What do we mean when we use that term? I hear it thrown around a lot, and I, I think it's helpful to get some clarity around that. Yeah, for sure. So sex addiction uh, is two things for me, right? One is the, it's an illness of escape. It's how men and women, but mostly I'm just gonna talk from a male perspective. It's how they escape from the realities of life. And the more they escape, the more their reality becomes more and more distorted. The second piece to sex addiction is a compulsivity of the need and the desire for looking at porn or acting out in some form or another. And it's, and I say that porn is the gateway to really, really maladaptive behaviors like having affairs, prostitution, um, strip clubs, things of that nature. It's just the gateway that opens up the door for so much more uh, maladaptive behaviors. Of course, um, one of the things that we're very aware of is how prevalent porn is, how easily accessible it is. You know, back in the day, it used to be that maybe somebody's dad would have a stash of Playboys. Um, but now if you have a handheld device, you have access to porn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere and anywhere. And it's, it's right there at the fin at your fingertips. And so where, like you said, what used to be just a magazine that you used to stash away is a lot more accessible because of the technology that we have. You've got your cell phones, you've got your iPads, laptops, you know, you name it. And even gaming devices has access to pornography as well. And so there's a wide variety of ways to be able to view porn and uh, get really entangled into that into that world. Uh, one of the mistaken beliefs that I had was that that porn was accessible only if you paid for it. So I thought kids, you know, wouldn't be able to ac access it unless they had a credit card. But it was a big shocker to realize that that's not the case. Yeah, a lot of the porn sites like Pornhub and, and other sites, they will give you free access to small little video clips. Maybe it's five, 10 minutes or whatever the case may be so that you get the full access to the membership. And that's how they hook you, right. is by giving you those small little uh, baits, those little uh, v small sh videos. And then if you watch that, and they've got quite a few of the free ones, and then if you get entangled in those videos, they know you're gonna want more. And if you want more, you're gonna have to pay for the full access. So one of the things I think is really important is uh, you know, for parents these days, if you have children, <laughs> is, to know, um, is to know how available this is. What impact? I mean, how, how young are, are kids accessing porn these days and, and what impact does that have on their development? Yeah, so look, uh, a lot of the clients that I've actually dealt with over the years is they've started watching porn as early as um, eight, nine, 10. And these, the clients that I deal with are obviously uh, a little bit older. So they've started with, you know, the porn stash of magazines mm -hmm. and things of that nature. The younger clients that I see that are in their 20s, it's, uh, they have access to it just by going online. And mom and dad don't really know about what's going on. And because our culture today is, there's a lot of uh, detachment in the family. 
My kids go off into their room, close the door and just watch, supposedly do homework or just talking to friends and unbeknownst to the mom and dad, you know, they don't realize what's really happening behind that closed door. Um, is, well, I, I guess I would say what, what impact does porn have on that developing brain then? I mean, is this akin to giving a child heroin? I mean, what, like, what do we see happen really as they're forming? Yeah, so a lot of addiction tends to start from a genesis of some form of trauma. I, what I mean by trauma is um, it could be something like at a very young age, a child um, what has in a family where there was addiction. Mm -hmm. So they grew up seeing mom and dad having an alcohol issue, uh, drug issues, um, maybe even porn addictions as well. So it's ingrained inside of them at a very young age. It's been modeled to them of what, how mom and dad don't know how to deal with life stressors. And so they go to something else mm -hmm. to help find relief. And so that's one of the things. Another thing is that a child tends to grow up in a household where it's very authoritarian. Uh, a lot of rules and regulations, and there's not a whole lot of grace in that house. And so there's always this need to be perfect at everything that I do. And if I can't seem to be perfect, I get overwhelmed by these emotions that I don't know how to deal with. And then they slip into and find at a very young age, 10, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever the age may be, where their friends found porn. Mm -hmm. They find porn through their friends, then they get entangled in that because, and then the brain finds a sense of relief from everything that I was going through. And this creates the addiction cycle for that child is that every time I get overwhelmed by some things that are going on in my life, I go to this thing and this thing helps me to feel uh, a sense of relief. And then there's another uh, reason for why kids go into uh, porn is because sex has been um, shamed at a very young age mom and dads are not really having the, don't have the words to talk to their kids about sex. You know, mom <laughs> and dads are kind of like, hey, look, I don't know what to say about that. So you take that one, right? right. And so they're always kind of divvying up, uh, well, you take it, no, you take it. And so there's just difficulty just having that conversation around sex. And so sex has become this forbidden fruit, you know, so it's because they're, they can't seem to find the words, mom and dad will sit there and say, just don't do it. Sex is bad. Right. And so then they, with their curiosity, are going to look for answers instead of being able to turn to mom and dad or looking for Correct. answers elsewhere. Correct. And of course, that's not really anything new. I mean, in terms of kids, you know, like they would go ask each other or talk to each other yeah. or pass notes or whatever. Uh, but just, you know, now I think the information that's available can can be really overwhelming for a young person if oh, they don't sure. have the framework to put it in. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So family conversations are super important. It sounds super, like one of the takeaways. Super important. But, you know, even before you have to have those conversations with a child, mom and dad have to be able to have mm. conversations. Because if mom and dad can have those really healthy conversations, those conversations with the child is going to go really, really well. Because the child sees mom and dad is comfortable about this topic. They seem relaxed and they seem very united on this conversation, on this topic. So then I can talk freely with mom and dad about this topic because they don't have any shame around it. Right. But if mom and dad has some shame, the child picks up on the fact that this is a forbidden thing. There's something wrong about this topic. So I'll just say, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> and then just be on our way. Right, right, right. But if the child picks up that there is, oh, there's, we can have a conversation and that there is a dual conversation. It's not just, or it's a two way rather than a just you telling me about sex and not to do it. It's a actually two way. We can have a conversation around that. That helps out a lot. Do you think um, the filters are effective for parents trying to control a child's access to porn? Yeah, I, look, I, it's a lot better than no filters, right? right? So like some of the things that I tell my guys to put on their devices on all of their technology is Covenant Eyes. That's one of the apps that you can install on any technology. There's another one called Accountability to You. Those are the two ones, the two apps that uh, my guys tend to use. And those apps, so those filters will put, will screen anything that they look at. So let's take snapshot pictures of their screen and they look for certain trigger words, sex, um, hot, babe, you know, certain words, and they'll capture that information, send it to uh, their, um, 
their accountability partner, which okay. tends to be me. Um, and so with, with kids, that could be something that'd be helpful just in terms yeah. of as a parent to know what your child's Absolutely. looking at Absolutely. and how to have those conversations. Correct. And I would think the important thing would be to open up the lines of communication, not to heap piles of shame on your kid. <laughs> Correct. And once again, going back to being able to have those healthy dialogues, those healthy conversations, normalizing mm -hmm. the fact that a child is curious rather than shaming that child for their curiosity because it's very common for a child at a very young age to start to be curious about their own bodies uh, and their the sexual organs and how does this play out what does this mean and and the feelings that comes from all of that to be able to normalize that for a child and say this is normal this is part of child development and we expected this so let's have a conversation right so I want to shift now, and I think this has been so helpful in terms of talking about, you know, what parents need to know, but I, I want to talk to, uh, talk about, you know, the relationship. What, um, I mean, first of all, just because somebody's accessing porn doesn't mean there's, they have a sex addiction, right? Correct. Um, just because an individual may be looking at porn, it doesn't necessarily mean there's an addiction, right? I'm going to use an example of just chocolate cake, right? I love chocolate cake. But just because I like chocolate cake doesn't mean necessarily that I have a food addiction, right? The food addiction or an addiction comes from the compulsivity that I'm constantly thinking about and wanting that chocolate cake. Okay. That's where it becomes more pervasive as an addiction. And if you go to breakingfreesolutions.com, we have a free assessment that anybody can take to determine if you do have an addiction for sex addiction or not, there's 10 criteria that you have to meet. And out of those 10, you, all you need to do is just meet three out of the 10 to, to classify as a, an addiction. And what are some of those, those indicators? What, what are some of the things somebody needs to look for yeah. in themselves or in their partner? Yeah, so one of the, one of the things that tends to be a, one of the signs of an addiction is if you are looking at porn and you know you shouldn't be looking at porn you try to stop looking at porn but you can't seem to stop that's one of the indicators is that the compulsivity of wanting to go back and you don't want to go back but there's a compulsion to go back is really overwhelming for you and you just can't seem to break that another one is that as you tend to uh, go into porn and start to act out in sexual behaviors there's an escalation that it's no longer just looking at porn, but now you're going into prostitution. Now there's affairs. Now there's or messaging. I would think to reaching online out to apps, online apps, apps, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's an escalation, and there's uh, another indicator is that you can't seem to uh, stop that cycle, and it starts to permeate into your relationships. That you're no longer being able to connect with your family you're no longer able to be as productive as and effective at work uh, you you're no longer attached or involved in social activities um, those are some of those signs that uh, says that there's probably an addiction taking place um very interesting what if if a spouse who's watching this is concerned that their partner maybe is um in the throes of an addiction what what should they do what I mean, what, what steps should they take? I mean, I, I don't know if, you know, probably, they probably have been trying to talk to them about it and that's probably not working. So what do you, what do you suggest? Yeah. So there's, um, there's a, a book that I would recommend for the partner. And that part, that book is called Shat uh, Mending a Shattered Heart. It's by Stephanie Carnes. It's a really great book that gives the partner a really great perspective of what's going on, what's the situ what is happening to their partner and how is it impacting the relationship and some things that she or he needs to be considering as they think through, does my partner truly have a sex addiction? That's one area that I, one resource that I would recommend. Another one is just being able to have an honest, honest conversation with your spouse about, and not shaming him mm -hmm. or her about the fact that there's a concern there, right? And it's just expressing a, a concern. I don't know if this is real or if this is true, but it seems like just based off of what I've heard and what I've learned about sex addiction, as small as it may be, that there may be something here that we need to look into. And the reason for the, that we are not able to connect, that concerns me. And if I would love for us to be able to have the opportunity to go look into and see what's, is there something that we can do to get help? 
If that doesn't work, then what I usually tell that partner is to come in and get help for themselves and to be able to find ways uh, to get their partner to potentially come in and address and, and, and talk about it. And then that partner also uh, needs to learn how to set boundaries with that, with the, the addict. Right. You know, one of the things I know from, um, you know, working with uh, a lot of partners in the divorce process, um, because they're not able to connect and they're not able to work it out, right? It's just, there's so much shame us in both, for both people, I know, for the person who's, you know, in the throes of the addictive behavior and then also for the partner just feeling like you're not enough or, or whatever it is. And, um, and let's talk about the role of shame in, in the addiction cycle. Yeah, look, this, uh, shame is one of the main, is the main driver behind the, the whole system of addiction. Um, it's the, it's the genesis of it. It's in our the addictive cycle. There's two cycles and the top cycle, the original cycle is the belief system and the belief system that create, that generates the addiction is I'm not good enough mm -hmm. and that I'm not good enough, or I feel like I'm not smart enough, handsome enough, you know, good looking enough, whatever it may be causes that person to have an impaired thinking about themselves and about the world around them and the relationships that they're in. That I'm only good if I do these things. And if I can't do these things or I'm making you disappointed, I feel shame. And I can't deal with the fact that I feel so much shame inside of myself that I need to find something or someone else to help me escape this feeling of shame. Because it doesn't, the behavior, the addictive, whatever the addictive behavior is, it doesn't Correct. make you feel like you're good enough. It doesn't bring you to that place Correct. of, you know, feeling it. It yeah. makes you just feel more of the shame. It perpetuates more. Absolutely. And then that's why I love using just the chocolate cake <laughs> analogy, right? Everybody loves chocolate cake, but those who really go are emotional eaters, they go to chocolate cake and they eat that chocolate cake and feel so good after that chocolate cake. But then immediately afterwards, there's this deep sense of guilt and shame about the fact that I just ate, not a slice, but two or three mm -hmm. slices. And they feel so bad about the fact that they did that, that they say, I'm never going to touch this again. I'm never going to eat chocolate cake. And then they go about a few days and then there's, they get into this stressful situation, circumstance, and then their brain immediately goes to, hey, there was this thing over here that helped. Let's go back there again because I can't seem to deal with all of this. So there's shame in that as well. And then you're right, the partner who, the betrayed partner has a deep sense of shame uh, and confusion and a, a, their identity gets uh, uh, turned upside down. It really does, I think in large part, because you know, you when, when the acknowledgement happens that this is a part of our life. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's a part of a lot of people's lives. So, I mean, really, I think if we could have more conversations about it, we could really help demystify and take away the shame Absolutely. and shine light because it, it is something that is, is happening in a lot of marriages these days. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess I would ask you, you just mentioned you're working with partners. I mean, do you, what resources are available for a partner who discovers that this is now a part of their life? Yeah. So one of the things, like, uh, like I said, is if you go to our breakingfreesolutions.com, there's a free assessment. It, it just, you just answer 10 questions. And if you've answered yes to three or more of those questions, there's very likelihood that there is a, an addiction going mm -hmm. on. And if that's the case, we would love for you to be able to come in and meet with us and, and meet with me specifically and really kind of do a full assessment on what's going on, what's the situation, what's your life like, and then give you two um, assessments that you can also take online that really gets into behind, under the hood. What are the things in the addiction that st you struggle with? And then that's where is our work to be able to kind of unravel all of that and, and be able to address that in a more healthy way. The thing that I tell a lot of my guys that come in to do this work is they're looking for Sam, I, I just want to get sober. I just want to beat this thing. I just want to be, and I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to struggle with this anymore. Right. And so what I tell those guys is, Hey, look, my goal here is not to try to get you to a place of sobriety, although that is a byproduct of what I want to do for you. But the main goal for what I want to do for these guys is to be able to help them have connection. Mm. Because if they can have healthy connection with human beings, not just with their partner, but with just people, 
their need to go to this thing when they are in distress is start going to start to go away because they will find a healthy attachment to an individual that cares for them, loves them, and wants the best for them. And if they can find that healthy attachment to a real person, the attachment that they created to this virtual world starts to dissipate. You know, it's interesting as you talk about that, it just brings to mind that we often focus so much um, on the couple, you know, who's dealing with a sex addiction. But um, from what you're saying, the addiction itself actually will impact broader relationships. I imagine the parent-child relationships Absolutely. and relationships with other family. Members. Absolutely. I've, I've had wives that have come in and talked to me and they said that my husband is no longer engaged with not just me, but with the kids. Like to get him to come to the soccer games, mm -hmm. to the recitals, to this activity, to that activity or social activities, it's so difficult because he just isn't present. And it's not just physically he's not present, but emotionally, mentally, he's just not engaged. And that's, that's one of the goals behind the work that I do is to help build that connection of engagement, of attachment, and being able to really express verbally and emotionally what's going on with you so that your partner can be a resource to you being able to find a healthy solution. So what um, I want to I want to talk now a little bit about what what does treatment look like for sex addiction? What are what are you seeing um, and what opportunities are available? I know so many people who are dealing with this just feel completely hopeless. Um, and you know that that can be overwhelming too. Yeah. So let's talk about kind of the, the hopeful side of what of the work that you're doing. Yeah. So there's a three prong approach that we take uh, at Breaking Free Solutions. One is we work with the addict, and working with the addict, what that means is is really opening up that box that they've closed up for decades. And then what that means also what that means is going back to their childhood, looking for any kind of trauma that they've experienced, any shame that they experienced at a very young age, any like mom and dad could have been very hypercritical and, and um, demeaning uh, or just distant, neglectful, abandoned. You know, those kinds of traumatic moments plays a huge role. So there's a lot of therapies that we do to help deal with that trauma from their childhood. And then it's also like, as I said, it's just helping that individual to start to cope, coming up with healthier coping strategies rather than going to porn is to be able to exercise, to do mindfulness, to be able to um, have conversations and identify your emotions and express those emotions. A lot of men don't really understand what emotions that they have other than happy, sad and angry. That's their vocabulary, right? That was me. I mean, that was the extent of my vocabulary. And I had to really extend that vocabulary and learn more about, wait, what's truly going on inside of me? And then being able to be comfortable and safe enough to be able to express that to my partner. So that's a lot of the work that we do with the addict. The second prong is dealing with the betrayed partner. She or he is going to be going through a lot of disappointment, um, betrayal work, uh, boundary work. Uh, they don't really un understand what, what the situation is and why would he do this? There's a lot of insecurities that mm -hmm. comes from, for, for that individual. They feel very less than, they don't feel very attractive. There must be something wrong with me. And so their identity gets rocked. And it's, it's very similar to as if they were found out that they were adopted. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's interesting because I definitely, um, I have seen so many people struggle with that because it is it is a total identity shift. You oh, know, the yes. person you thought you were married to and the life you thought you were building together Correct. now feels like a complete lie. Correct. And that, that can be so hard to overcome. And it's really hard not to take it personally. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> I think Absolutely. that's the sex is so personal. And then when you find out your, you know, your partner is having sex with other people or, or you know, in the throes or of addiction or not. Yeah. Or even just the videos that the guy is watching and comparing her to those women on the video screen. It's just like, I can't even compare to that. And so right. there's a deep sense of insecurity that comes from all of that, uh, that she needs to work through, he needs to work through mm -hmm. um, and be able to come out of that and learn how to set boundaries to really settle into your own identity of who you are and what does that really mean apart from your partner and to do betrayal work. There's a lot yeah. of grief that comes from this. 
And doing grief counseling is another component to helping the partner heal. The third prong that we deal with is then if we're working with the addict and we're working with the partner, then the third prong is to be able to bring, bridge that gap, bring them together and do couples therapy and learning and teaching them how to communicate. How do we rebuild intimacy emotionally, mentally, physically, and just creating a safe space for both of them? So that's the three prong approach that we take to. And, um, you know, one of the things I'll just comment on is that, um, you know, a lot of times the the there was a lot that wasn't right with the marriage, right? Before we even discovered the sex addiction piece of it. Yep. And, um, you know, this is this is an opportunity. If people are willing, if they're willing to roll up their sleeves, they're willing to reach out, they're willing to engage with a, a therapist like you, this can really be an opportunity to develop the the authentic relationship. Correct. That you both yearn for. Correct. It's the authentic relationship that is comes from two authentic people. Mm. And when you can bring two authentic people, you're going to have a really great attachment with them because they have learned who you each person truly is. And then because now I know who you truly are, I get to have a choice in choosing you. Wanting. I, I would imagine that the trust is something that's really hard to build back. Um, yeah. And how do you how do you sort of see that evolve as you work with couples? Yeah. So whether it's pornography, you know, or not, you know, we deal with at the marriage place, we deal with a lot of couples that come in with broken trust because of infidelity or just lies and, and secrecy. Uh, and so a lot of that is just rebuilding a trust by um, boundaries. You know, we've got to really put some nice, healthy boundaries around that relationship for both of them mm -hmm. to feel like, OK, I feel safe enough to move forward, because if we can't create and establish that just that foundation of healthy boundaries, there's just no way that any one person is going to be able to trust in that relationship. So boundary work is like one of those first steps that we have to do. Accountability is another thing that we have to teach both individuals, mm -hmm. specifically the man or the addict, is the ability to take accountability for what I, it is that I've done. A lot of men feel so much shame about what they've done by acting out in certain ways. Their partner is still stuck at square one. Mm. And so because you're still stuck at square one, you're always grieving. I don't like the fact that you're grieving all the time, so let's just move forward. And I have to teach the man to be able to just, hey, let's just sit here and just let's grieve with your partner rather than pushing your partner two steps ahead when she or he may mm. not be ready. It's really, really important work. Yeah. Um, you know, there there's some controversy over the issue of sex addiction. I know in the last, you know, manual, the DSM, it wasn't recognized as a formal diagnosis. What is that? I, I mean, what does that mean? What do you think in terms of the future? Why why do you think it, it isn't recognized? And um, and how does that impact maybe our cultural view of what's happening in the throes of sex addiction? Yeah, so uh, a lot of that is, you know, there's a battle in the, in the psychology world of whether this is truly an addiction or not. I tend to believe that it is because it fits the exact model of all the other addictions out there, whether it's heroin or cocaine or alcohol, whatever it may be, there's this compulsivity that aligns with all the other addictions. So I'm not sure why we don't call this sex addiction either, but I, I, I'm in that camp that believes that we do need to treat this very similar to similarly to the other addictions. Sex addiction is one of those topics that has a comorbidity with the other addictions. Mm. So if you've got sex addiction, you most likely have other addictions as well. And that's what I've seen with a lot of my men is there is alcohol addiction to it. There's alcoholism. There tends to be a lot of use with drugs, uh, street drugs or just prescription drugs. And then there's also uh, emotional eating, food addiction. A lot of these guys can't can't seem to break the sex addiction very well, and then that leads straight to other forms of addiction as well. And, and I think um, you know one of the things that's important too um, is that it doesn't just because it's labeled as an addiction doesn't doesn't mean it's you know excusable. It doesn't. Um, 
mean that there's not personal responsibility associated with that. Um, but how does, how does calling something an addiction really inform then how we respond to it? Yeah, it's a brain thing. It's a brain issue. It's a chemical in your brain that creates this compulsivity towards the thing. And you can't just will it, <laughs> will your way through it, right? It's, you have to be able to look at this as a brain science, a neuroscience kind of uh, an approach to being able to wean an individual off of that thing that there's this compulsion towards. And so um, a lot of it is really being able to see it as truly an addiction, because if you don't see it as an addiction, then you're going to minimize and dismiss the severity of what really is needed. I've seen many guys come in here and say, well, Sam, you know, hey, look, yeah, I don't think it's an addiction. I think it's just something that I struggle with, but I can beat it anytime I want. Right? <laughs> and we hear that with other things like alcohol and other, yeah, Correct, other different right? behaviors. And so just being able to deal with those 12 step approach of just being able to, hey, let's just deal with the denial. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there, is there truly an issue here? And, and, and coming to terms with that, that's like huge for a lot of guys. Luckily, I have a lot of guys, well, not, not luckily for them, but they come in here getting past the denial. They're like, okay, I got a problem because everything blew up. Mm -hmm. You know, their wife found out, their friends found out, whatever it may be, and their world is just completely just blown up. And now they're coming in saying, okay, I've got an issue. How do I deal with this? I've got some guys that come in and saying, okay, I don't think it's an addiction like my wife thinks, but you know, I may have some <laughs> issue with this porn thing, but look, Sam, I can beat this in a couple of months. So let's just do this sessions just to appease my wife and then I can get through this. And I, they come to realize, no, I truly do have a problem here. Yeah, yeah, they can admit they're helpless. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Are you working through a 12-step program with them that's similar to like an Alcoholics Anonymous kind of thing? It is, it's, it's a 12-step kind of program. It's a 30-task model that we use from uh, Patrick Carnes, who's the creator of, of this approach. And it has been uh, tested. It is um, evidence-based. And so that's the reason why I got certified to be a sex addiction therapist, is that approach that, that he has been using for decades has been very effective. And it does follow the 12-step pro, uh, process as well, just like you would see at AA. Yeah, great. Yeah. You know, as we kind of wrap up our time here today, yeah. and this has been so helpful, What? What is your message of hope for people who, you know, this is this is a part of their family. This is a part of their life. Yeah. Look, my my statement of hope would be to any individual that is struggling with this male or female is that you can take your life back. Like you don't have to be ch shackled to this thing anymore. You can start to come out of the fog and start to really see life the way it was meant to and really start to attach to people and connect with people in a way that you will truly feel safe, loved and accepted by those who want to love you mm -hmm. rather than being um, detached from this world and living a distorted life. There is so much more. There's abundant life on this side. You just have to take that first step. Oh, that's a great mess message of hope. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. And if you want to learn more about Sam John and his practice at Bre Breaking Free Solutions, we'll include a link to his website and we hope you'll follow up with him. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm.